I'm curious, where do you consider yourself politically? If, if, is there a label that you like? Because I sense sort of a classical liberalism here, but maybe something a little more closer to a traditional Democrat. I'm, I'm not quite yeah, sure. Yeah, you know, as I told you earlier um, on the phone, I, I, I'm not really politically that astute. I just have these feelings that align me with the left. So I've always voted Democratic my whole life. Um, and I consider myself a liberal. But what a liberal means now, as you know, is changing. A lot of people consider themselves liberals who are actually illiberal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, the, the regressive or illiberal left. And I don't align myself with those groups at all. So, yeah. You know. And in your world, in the science world, you have to deal with facts. You can't deal with these feelings all the time. So that, that illiberal left must drive you completely crazy. I know it does because I've read plenty of your writing. Yeah. I mean, in science, the one thing that Freedom of speech is absolutely essential in science. And just this moment I realized that that may be why I'm such a free speech advocate because if you censor yourself or you allow yourself to be censored in science, you're, you're doing something really bad. I mean, the freedom of discourse, the freedom to criticize somebody, no matter how ill-founded you are or you think they are, is the absolute sine qua non for scientific progress. And when you see this happening in science, that some, I mean, outside of science, that some ideas are off limits, that you can't talk about them. So like, just, what, like what, for example? Like what uh, would be something that's off limits? Like, Oh, what's happened to Milo Yiannopoulos, for example? I mean, yeah. I just read this morning that he had been booted off UC Davis campus because, you know, um, I didn't know you've had Milo on your show he's before. He's coming back in two weeks. Yeah, we'll see so, what happens. You know, um, he's a bit of a provocateur. I don't know if everything he says he really believes. I mean, he's made statements like... Um, there's no such thing as a lesbian. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I don't really think that's true. I think he says that to get people's standard up. But on the other hand, he has said stuff that should be said because it starts a conversation in society. Mm -hmm. Like, do we have a rape culture in the United States? I mean, I, you know, a lot of radical feminists will, well, well, if you deny that, they'll just jump down your throat. They'll call you a, a, a misogynist. But what, you know, what is a rape culture? Is it a culture that actually condones rape? We don't right. live in that culture. We certainly kind of culture. don't live in that culture. <laughs> is it a culture where if you're a convicted rapist, you get off more easily than if you committed some other crime? I don't think so. Certainly every rape is one rape too many, and they should be punished to the limit of the law. But to say something like that, and that's the kind of thing that Milo says, which actually should be discussed. We need this kind of stuff um, to discussion. But there are certain things now, other things that cannot be questioned, like affirmative action, I'm in favor of affirmative action, um, but um, you know you cannot question it. But it's know? almost impossible to have an honest discussion yes. about it. And how and do the economics work, and actually, is it helping people? Yeah, and, and all of those things. Uh, so, what about in the scientific realm? That, that's what I originally meant. In the scientific realm, yes. are there places that you sometimes want to go that are shunned on? Or Absolutely. We, or, yeah, like what? What kind? Well, of there's, I'll give you two examples. The first one is is the concept of race. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, these both these examples. The other one is evolutionary psychology. Are valid areas of inquiry in in science, but ones which have ideological repercussions for a group of people. So, for example, you cannot say that there are human races because it makes people say, "Well, you're just enabling racism if you say that." You know? Right. And now, the, but you're saying that there are races. Well, no. I mean, this <laughs> is a really, really touchy subject because the human species is not distributed into a finite number of easily distinguishable genetic groups. Mm -hmm. But what happens is that if you can take a person's genome and sequence it, you can pretty much place where they came from. So there are, in the aggregate, genetic differences between groups. Now, they're not large because we've all come out of Africa about 60,000 years ago. There hasn't been time for this wholesale accumulation of differences. Um, but they're nevertheless, there are differences. And you can use statistical measures to, to show that they form roughly five or six different groups that are distributed geographically, as, as you might say, you know, there's the New World groups, there's Asian groups, there's Polynesians, um, there's Africans, and each of these groups was geographically separated at one time from other groups. So you expect them to become different. But, you know, you can't really even say that. Right. So <laughs> because it implies that, that there's a, a scale of inferiority and superiority. Right, so sometimes uh, people will say to me, I see this on Twitter, uh, a certain amount, you know, you're, you're focusing too much on the political correctness, or you're focusing too much on the free speech stuff, but you're giving me a great real world scientific example of why it's important, right? I mean, that's, that's really, to be able to talk about this stuff, for you as a scientist, it is important, 
But do you think a lot of scientists self-select out of that? And they oh, say, absolutely. Well, I'm just not going to even deal with this. Absolutely. I mean, the whole field of cultural anthropology is dedicated to vilifying those people that even want to study the, genetic differences between humans. Because then they look at that guy and they go, well, why would he want to do that? He must somehow be racist, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Just, he, why would he even look at that? Yeah, and when I write yeah. about race, and I try to avoid using the word race just because it's a hot button issue, I'll say ethnic groups or genetic differences. You know, And if you'll talk to the human geneticists that work in this, they'll say, yeah, of course, humans are genetic differentiated. We're a species like any other. Yeah. We're animals so, and we're spread over a huge area so there's going to be differences that have accumulated by evolutionary processes like selection and drift. But you can't say that. Instead <laughs> people say race is a social construct. Right. And I don't know what the hell that means. I mean if it's a social construct then somebody like Rachel Dolezal can designate herself as black even though she's not black right. by any means. But for some reason they don't like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. So um, that's one area in which research is basically taboo. Steve Pinker, I think, has spent a lot of his career trying to, um, sh to overcome these taboos in science. Um, it does not necessarily mean that if you're studying giant variation in humans, you're a racist. Mm -hmm. Most people aren't. They're just fascinated They're with the history of... And, you know, by studying this variation, we've learned things about how humans have migrated. We know now that we came to North America and South America over the Bering Straits about... 15,000 years ago from genetic evidence. I mean, we can use our genes to trace our migration patterns. We know that we mated with the Neanderthals. Right. Um, you know, probably, oh God, I don't know, uh, 60, 70,000 years ago. That's fascinating. It doesn't have many practical implications, but, you know, a lot of evolutionary biology is like Lawrence Krauss said. It's knowledge, it's art, it's fascinating. It doesn't necessarily have to make you rich or wealthy. We, and the only reason we know all this stuff about humans is because humans are genetically different in different places. We wouldn't be able to trace their migration. You wouldn't be able to trace your ancestry by sending in a kit to 23andMe if humans did not have these genetic differences. Right. So, but to talk about them is, is almost a taboo. The other example, which God Saad talked about two days ago, um, was evolutionary psychology. The idea that we bear in our behaviors and in our bodies remnants of um, evolutionary processes that occurred in our ancestors, that's taboo. So, so, so okay, so I've talked about this with Gad a little bit. Yeah. Um, I'm still struggling to understand what's the taboo part. Why would that be... What's the part of that that people struggle with? Well, it's been, the, mo the main area, um, besides the race thing, um, because the, well, let me back up. Yeah. The main thing is males, the difference between males and females, um, evolutionary psychology, because that's, the, that's what evolutionary psychology has by and large concentrated on, although there are other things as well. And they think, just as the cultural anthropologists say that you're, you're a racist if you're studying races, <laughs> if you're studying evolutionary differences and say mating behavior between males and females, you must be a sexist, right? Which of course is absolutely insane. Well, it is. And you know, <laughs> just like they say races are social constructs. Yeah. And I, I gotta say, I gotta add one thing in here which always amused me. When I was writing my NIH grants to get my funding from my research that asks you what your ethnicity, what your race was, and you had to tick off a box, like, you know, uh, Inuit, South Pacific Islander, white, black, Hispanic, and then at the bottom of the box it said, no, these, these classifications are social constructs only. <laughs> <laughs> and, and yet, I was writing, you know, a genetic grant. So right, that's based, hilarious. Yeah, and, so was, did you say, you should just, well, why are you asking me that? Yeah, <laughs> if I did that, I wouldn't get a grant. Yeah. But, so the main, <laughs> the main thing is, is, is the, that people think that evolutionary psychology um, is a, a vehicle for enabling sexism, you know. My response to that is always this, to point out that males are bigger and more muscular than females. And that's a, definitely a genetic difference. And it's the same in virtually every other species of primate, with very few exceptions. And we know why that is. It's because males compete with each other for access for females. There's very good evolutionary theory on that. It's exactly what you expect. We have huge difference in upper body strength. Mating strategies are so clearly different between males and females. Males are fairly promiscuous. Females are choosy, just like they are in other animals. So we have this confluence of lines of evidence that point to this most obvious difference between men and women in body size as a, as a result of what happened in our ancestors. So that basically know. all goes back to just hunter-gatherer stuff, right? That the man was out there hunting and the woman was Well, that's care one the theory about why men are stronger, but then that women had to stay home and reproduce and the men would have to be stronger. But there's a number of things that don't, that that doesn't explain, like the difference in choosiness between 
males and females. So, I mean, the, the, the theory which is supported by a lot of evidence is that the difference in body size between men and women is an evolutionary result of males competing for for females and females wanting well they would want the men that could hunt the best but they also want the men that would have the best genes but the fact is that here's the difference that is not is not cultural you cannot say that you know men and women are socialized men are socialized to be bigger than women right it just doesn't work that way and so if we can evolve these differences and there may be some truth to what you say about the hunter gatherer Thing, but that still shows that there's an evolutionary basis for the body size differences we see. The average man, I think, in America is 5'10". The average woman, I think, is 5'4". That's a pretty profound difference. And the body size... Oh, now you're going to be a heightist, too? You're really... Yeah. You're the whole thing here. <laughs> but so, you know, if there's such a profound difference in body size that's a result of evolutionary forces, why are we so resistant to thinking that there's evolutionary differences in behavior? Yeah, so when did that happen? When did this this political correctness, when did it creep into science? I mean, 50 years ago, if we were talking about this kind of stuff, would it be more okay to talk about? Oh, I mean, that, in fact, it was not only okay, it was de rigueur, but it was too far the other way because people would would make flat statements like there's a hierarchy of races and the whites are on top and the blacks are on the bottom and it's clearly intelligence. We don't have any evidence for that. So if you look at the textbooks in evolution from the 20s, you'll see this kind of invidious racism was why they accepted so some of the political correctness may be a reaction to that because they always point back and say look this is what biology gave us in the 1920s every evolutionist was promulgating the view that whites are superior and by and large that was true um, wait but, what was true oh that they were doing not oh, that yeah, whites are not that whites are superior. no they were promulgating the idea just pushing the idea yeah not with, that, with uh, no evidence at all and that right. led to some Pretty horrible I saved things. you there, because that's where people would cut the quote and go, you see what he just said? Oh, yeah, okay. So. Well, let me say for the record, <laughs> then, that there are no evidence. There is no evidence yeah. for that. And that biologists were pretty invidious racists as a whole. I mean, along with the rest of society back in the 1920s, I think mm -hmm. biologists just had another way of rationalizing it. But they were wrong. And so some of the political correctness is a reaction to this um, this over this biologist going overboard and biological determinism but there's a middle ground in which there are valid things to study and god saw it as one of the guys that studies them about human behavior and its evolutionary antecedents but they'll say gender is a social construct i mean you know if you look at humanity you know 99 percent of people will fall into the two tails of has a y chromosome identifies as male likes women um Two X chromosomes identifies female, likes men, and then you know there'll be some intersexes in between. But to say that it's gender is a social construct is is to me just completely fascinating. <laughs> yeah, I mean it just doesn't make any sense. So yeah. let's let's uh, circle back a little bit to evolution. Sure. Uh, so we're just on this road now, and we're we're evolving very slowly. At you know in the day to day, we're mm -hmm. evolving. Where does technology start coming into this? Because now we're where we are going to eventually, you know, you talk about like the singularity and just how science is going to change us. And we're going to start putting on, uh, you know, robotic arms and robotic limbs and eyes and all that. Can that be thought of as the next step of evolution? If you're taking something that's totally artificial and adding it to the well, it's not evolution. Stew? Yeah, it's is a that, good or is question. That something else? Well, there's two questions in there, that, and I'll try to answer both of them. First of all. Remember the definition of evolution I give you, which is genetic change in populations. So if you give somebody an artificial eye or an artificial hand, you're not changing the, the, gen the genetics of the population. What you're doing may be compensating for certain genetic defects. And so one of the results of medical intervention is that we have people living today who would not be surviving in the savannah. Yeah. I and mean, look at the lifespan of individuals in, our, in Australopithecus. It was probably 25, 30 years max. And now, due to science, we have you know, the average lifespan of probably 70 to 80 years in humans. Um, and that's a result of science, but it's not a result of genetic change at all. It's right. a result of medical intervention. So what's happened is people that would have been called and our ancestors are now leaving their genes behind. So is the gene pool degenerating? Yeah, to some extent it is. I hmm. mean, look at me. I have, you know, I'm myopic. Yep. You know, I have, uh, you know, crowns on some of my teeth. I probably would have a, had an abscess. I mean, <laughs> Christopher Hitchens pointed out that probably a major cause of death in our ancestors was tooth abscess. Yeah, <laughs> sure. You know, so to some extent, 
this medical intervention is causing evolution, but it's causing evolution to go downhill. In other words, the gene pool is degenerating um, very slowly. Right, you know? very slowly. But, and, but I would ask people that, that worry about this, you know, okay, do you want to kill those people? That would have, if somebody has an infection, do you want to withhold antibiotics from them and let them die? And, and nobody would say yes to that. So, you know, the, the slight degeneration of the gene pool um, caused by medical intervention which is evolution, is to me far outweighed by the fact that people live longer, healthier lives than they had before. So I'm not worried about that. But right, so I guess my question then is, although it's not evolution in the traditional sense, I'm a big sci-fi guy, as I say yeah. on the show every week, and that it seems to me that as time's gonna go by in a couple more decades, we're gonna slowly replace our parts. We're gonna slowly replace our organic stuff with artificial stuff. So we'd be evolving into something else, but I guess not in the technical term. Yeah, what you could, that would be cultural evolution, that, that's, uh, more or less. So right, cultural which I'm sure is offensive to someone somehow or something. Yeah, um, so that's what's gonna happen. I mean, the question I get more frequently from people is, well, are we still evolving it, genetically as a species? Mm -hmm. And that's a tough question because how do we know that? You know, um, we have to be able to see, and you know, it's such a slow process. We have to be able to see how people change and connect that with their reproductive advantage because evolution occurs by certain people leaving more genes than others that have certain traits. And so when people ask me this question, and they invariably do when I give a public lecture, where are we going evolutionarily? Are we getting smarter? Are we getting handsomer? You know, and my answer is, well, here's what we know about where we're evolving. Women are arriving at menopause later. They're, be they're starting to menstruate earlier and we're, are, resistance to heart attacks is going up. Hmm. And that's about all we know. It's not very exciting. It's not a lot. Yeah. Well, it's you not know that lot. you know this from, from like the Framingham Health Study where they will follow individuals and their offspring. And so they'll know, you know, the gen first of all, they'll know the correlation between parent and offspring, which gives you an idea of the genetics. And they'll also know the number of offspring that parents have, which give you an idea of how that genetics is connected to reproduction, which gives you an idea of how natural selection is working. So what's happening is that women are evolving to be remain fertile longer. They're coming into fertility condition earlier. Um, Europeans are getting taller a little bit. Um, and heart disease is, so we're, we are evolving. And we're always gonna evolve as long as we have genetic variation and sources of mortality that will kill us before we stop reproducing. <laughs> right, so could we have another one of those splits that you talked about if say, you know, 20 years from now, we've got a colony on Mars, so you have a separate uh, subset of people and that they start reproducing and there's different, uh, you know, physical pressures on them with gravity and all of these things. Could they, I, I suppose they would evolve differently than us, but it could happen kind of quicker, right? Because, because they'd be sort of the raw stuff there. Really? Yeah, well, and it depends on, first of all, if they'd have to be allowed to have children, and they'd have to be, if you're going to, and they'd have to be isolated from Earth. So if you right. send a colony out on Mars, if you keep So let's go with that. We send, yeah. a colony, we send 100 people. And we leave them out there. And we leave them out there, and yeah, now they forever, have to build this thing. Forever. Yeah. Then it is, I would certainly not say it's impossible for them to become a different species of human. What I would say is that you have to prevent migration back and forth because that's going to bring them closer together and what we need is for them to diverge genetically to become different species yeah but it would take maybe a million years to see any change so no you can... see some change oh. fairly quickly i mean you know there you know as long as there is differential reproduction based on you know maybe weightlessness people that can adapt with weightlessness better would leave more offspring on mars and and you might see some change pretty quickly but you have to have enough change that if you bring these people from Mars back to Earth, or you send people from Earth back to Mars, they would be unable to produce fertile offspring. Right. It can't just be slight differences in the way they look. Right, because that's the real definition of the change. Yeah, there has to be, or they would, they'd be so unrecognizably different to each other that they wouldn't want to mate with each other, which is a form of what we call behavioral isolation. It's many birds can produce fertile offspring, but they don't because they don't see each other as appropriate mates. So basically yeah. they could, over a few generations, there could be some physical changes for yeah, a Yeah, it'll probably of take reasons. a while. Remember, a generation of humans is probably 25, 30 years now. Right. So, you know, one, you know, it would take, you know, maybe 100 generations before we'd see anything perceptible, and that's, you know, several thousand years. Yeah. And then to get to the point where these people become reproductively incompatible with one another, I would say, I mean, this is just an offhand guess sure. based on other animals, a million years maybe. 
you know, and you know, would we be still be around then? Maybe not. But Probably not. Yeah, it's conceivable. Um, there were, as I said, at, in times in history, not now Neanderthals and humans were not different species, the same species, but we had diverged, you know, in physical ways, and you know, um, brow ridges and stuff, and we had Denisovans and other kinds of human groups which are probably the same species but in africa there were definitely different species of humans that probably could not interbreed that lived side by side the so-called robust australopithecines um you know there could have been as many as four or five different species of hominins i won't say humans just hominins things that that branched off from the chimps and and were part of the, the tree that evolved after that living side by side without mating with one another huh. and it's kind of and you know, there are some books about this, but there should be more books about this, um, written by maybe evolutionarily minded science fiction writers about what it would be like to have two cerebralized bipedal species meet each other and uh -huh. what, what would happen if that was the case. Yeah. Huh. I, maybe I'll write that book. Yeah. <laughs> I may, you may have to be my co-author. Yeah. All right, final question. I wanted to ask this uh, right at the top, but I feel like it's a nice way to, to wrap everything up. When you're in the lab with the microscope, mm -hmm and you're looking at all of this. Is that basically your, your, your greatest joy? Greatest joy? Um, the greatest joy is actually the moment where after two years of looking through the microscope, you put the data together and you see what it looks like and then you see what result you get. So, you know, it's punctuated joy. I mean, it's a lot of fun to do this, but you're waiting to find an answer. And those answers don't come every day. The <laughs> right. answers come when, you, and sometimes they just come when you press the button on a statistics program and all of a sudden you get what, you know, in the same way they found out the Higgs boson. I mean, all of a sudden they, you know, they have two different groups and they press a button and they, they see they got the same thing. Mm -hmm. So it's at the end of that process that you really find the greatest joy, but you know, I mean, it's like working on, I think of it a lot of like the people who worked on the medieval cathedrals, you know, they knew when they built Rhin or Notre Dame that they were not gonna see the product of their work in their lifetime. Mm -hmm. And, but they did it anyway because they knew that they were working towards some result. Well, in science, we do get a result in our lifetime. It's just that the, these moments of ineffable joy of discovery come very rarely, you know, and but that's what we're working to. But it's it all makes it worthwhile in the long run because without all that hard work of pushing flies under the microscope for years, you don't get to find out this cool thing at the end. So. Yeah, that's a pretty good ending right there. Yeah. Th there you go. All right. Well, for more on Jerry's work, check out why evolution is true. Wordpress. Com and let us know your thoughts right down below.